tonight. And uh, for those of you that didn't make it for the announcements, he's going to be here again tomorrow night for 6.30 service. A uh, rally that we're having on Saturday at 2 o'clock and then back for our, our main service, our regular service on Sunday at uh, 11 o'clock. And uh, we've just enjoyed so much his ministry. And I'm looking forward to see what God is going to do in each one of us tonight. Brother Winslow, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Praise the Lord, everybody. You may be seated. Uh, I may believe that God's an awesome God. If you know anything about God, you know that he is, there's just no one like him. And uh, if you've read your Bible, know everybody here has, and you're probably like me. You read the Word of God cover to cover every year. It's a very small thing to do. It's not very big to do. It's not very hard. You can do it less than 65 hours. And uh, if you were just started reading and just read straight through, take about 65 hours or less to read the Word of God through. So every year I read it cover to cover. But it's amazing that I find things in there that I didn't see the last 45 times. Um, and, uh, and God tells me things that are in the Word of God, and I go look at it, and it's there. And, but uh, the Word of God is so deep. It's not just vast. It's not just wide. It's not just high. But uh, the Word of God is so deep, and there's so many things in there. And the Word of God works by revelation. That's how it, the Word of God works. You can read something. But if the timing or the depth of your relationship with God is not at the place God wants it to be, he has a way of hiding that from you. Uh, I remember when I, I was uh, first got under conviction and God spoke to me about being baptized. And some of my friends, my family told me, well, you don't need to be baptized. You've already been baptized. You were baptized uh, uh, when you were just a little infant. I said, well, I know I was, but I read in the book of Acts where... Uh, the disciples of John the Baptist were rebaptized again. And I said, so in the Bible, some people were baptized again. And, uh, and I said, I, believe, I feel like God is dealing with me about being rebaptized. And so I got baptized and, and, um, and God showed me that revelation. When I received the Holy Ghost, first time to ever go to Pentecostal church, walked in the door, God filled me with the Holy Ghost that night. Uh, my wife was not at the same place. That I was probably because my wife was a very uh, good woman and uh, uh, just a, a great mother for our kids and just a great woman. On the other hand, uh, I was just, uh, let me say, low down and good for nothing. And uh, I, I was just a, a, a dark sinner. And uh, so surely when God started convicting me and when God forgave me, remember what Jesus said? To whom much is forgiven. They're going to love a lot. And so, uh, you know, I fell in that category. Probably some of you were not, I mean, it probably took a, a little bit for God to get you under conviction because you were, probably was a pretty good person. But for us that were not a very good person, well, it didn't take much convicting power of God to get us to repenting because we already knew how miserable we were and how we were treating everybody. But God works by revelation and he speaks to us things in the word of God. He uses everyday events in our lives to explain things to us. There was no preacher like Jesus. When he came, he used rocks and seeds and sowers and fishermen as examples of the word of God. He compared his word to a man with a sack of seed that was uh, uh, spreading that seed out, sowing the seed. And uh, so the Lord uses those things to speak to us. And, and God starts talking to us about everyday things. One of the, one of the, there's only two ways to really learn about following God and two ways to learn about life. And, and that is through hard knocks and by going through things. And the second way is through mentors that God gives you. One of the great examples of mentorship in the Bible was Jesus and 12 men that he chose. And he began to show them things and tell them things. And of course it took the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost to really put all that stuff into action and they became different people. How many knows that's the truth? You ever read that in the Bible? Once they received the Holy Ghost, they really started walking different and talking different and acting different. Well, Acts 1 and 8 says, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So we know that to be the truth. But um, the Word of God uh, uh, speaks to us through mentors. Well, we could go through hard knocks 
and, and learn by examples. Or we can have someone that God puts in our life to teach us and to tell us. And I told the Lord uh, the first year I was saved, God, let me have a heart and a mind and eyes to see what you say and what you're showing me. No, I don't want to have to go through a trial. I don't want to have to go through hard times for you to get my attention. I want to spend time praying and keeping my heart right and be in a place where I can listen to you and be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. And, and, uh, and God starts sending mentors into my life. People that would tell me things and show me things and show me how to operate in faith and, and uh, would spend time talking to me. And all through my life, I've had mentors. The last great mentor I had in my life was an apostle by the name of uh, T.W. Barnes. He was a prophet and he was an apostle and he was a pastor and he was a teacher and he was an evangelist. He was all five. And, uh, and God uh, allowed me to go there, to move there. And uh, I moved from California to Menden, Louisiana, and I live four houses down from this great man of God. And if you don't know anything about him, you can Google his name, T.W. Barnes, and you could just see so many things that God did in his life and through his life. And uh, he started his ministry in the late 20s. I remember one day I was driving by his house, and I just got in from Revival. I usually get in Sunday night or Monday sometimes from the, the revival I'd be preaching. And on Tuesday, I would go down to his house and spend at least an hour. I'd be very sensitive. I'd watch in his actions. And when I would deem that it was uh, he had something to do, I would excuse myself and leave. But, but I'd go in on Tuesdays and I'd sit down. We'd talk about faith. And he'd tell me miracles and things that God had done for him. And, and uh, some of the things about faith and believing God. He was a mentor to me. And he would tell me things and show me things and give examples. Well, you all have mentors in your life. One of them is your pastor, the man of God. Sometimes there's family members that are mentors. In the physical, worldly world, the carnal world, you had fathers and mothers. Maybe an uncle or somebody that helped teach you about life. And so one way to learn is through a mentor. God's going to touch you tonight. And God's going to give you knowledge tonight that you're not going to have to experience for yourself. God's going to speak something tonight in this service. You're going to catch it. You're going to start believing it. You're going to start walking in it. And God's going to start showing you things. So I, I'd moved from California to Menden, Louisiana, because God told me to. And Brother Barnes permitted me to uh, come there. And, and uh, so I, I, bought, uh, I rented a house and four houses down. And well, one day I was on Tuesday, I was driving toward his house, just four houses down and the Lord spoke to me before I pulled into the uh, driveway and said, go, uh, go buy Brother Barnes a pair of shoes. Well, I, I, I didn't even question God. God said, do it. I was more than happy to buy a pair of shoes for my mentor. I had no idea there was a prophetic word over that. I did not know that God had spoken to Brother Barnes uh, in the late 20s about shoes I didn't know anything about the miracles of shoes and what that represented uh, with Brother Barnes and people that would buy him shoes. I just know that just before I pulled into his house, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, go buy Brother Barnes a pair of shoes. So I'm driving to town and I called Sister Barnes, answered the phone. And I said, Sister Barnes, what size shoe does Brother Barnes wear? Well, he wears 11. I said, all right, does he wear any kinds of shoes? She said, no. And she told me what kind and told me where to buy it at. And said, he's been wearing the same kind of shoes for years. So I go down and I go to the store and I walk in there and I tell the salesman, I want to buy a pair of shoes size 11. He says, well, what color do you want? Well, I didn't think about that. I didn't ask Sister Barnes. And so as I was sitting there, I thought to myself, if I buy one pair of shoes, that's a single dose. But if I buy two pairs of shoes, that's a, that's a double portion. And uh, so I said, well, give me a brown pair and a black pair. So I come back to Brother Barnes' house, and I ring the doorbell, and Sister Barnes comes to the door. And I said, Sister Barnes, I've got some shoes for Brother Barnes. I wasn't going to go in. And I heard Brother Barnes' voice say, Brother Winslow, come on in and sit down. I'm going to tell you about these shoes. So I hand him the shoes and I sit down. He said, in 1929, 
God had called me to preach, but I wasn't sure about it. He said, we were living in that depression era and things were very hard. And I had never had a pair of brand new shoes in my entire life. And very seldom did I see people with brand new shoes. Usually it was a hand-me-down that somebody had. Uh, the more wealthy people would hand down and hand down. And, and he said, so I was out praying in the woods. And, and he said, and I told the Lord, if you, do you really want me to preach? Are you really calling me to preach? And then he said, Lord, if you're calling me to preach, then let there be a brand new pair of shoes on my porch when I get back home. From praying. And Brother Barnes told me, he said, I knew that if there was a brand new pair of shoes on that porch, it'd be a miracle. It'd be God. He said, But I knew that God could do it. And he said, I wasn't real sure if God that's what God wanted me to do. He said, So after praying several hours, I come home and on my porch is a pair of shoes. And he said, I put those shoes on and I was more happy that I knew the will of God. Because something happens once you know the will of God, you can really use your faith after that. But before you know the will of God, the devil can lie to you and trick you and he can send people your way and get you sidetracked. But once you get revelation from God, it's like the straightaway in a race. It's now it's a uh, 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 pedal to the metal. It's floorboard. It's give it all you got because you know what the will of God is. Saints, it's worth it to seek God. It's worth it to pray and ask God to give you his will and to reveal it to you because it's not wasted time. Because once you know the will of God, you can just release your faith and just let go and believe God. And so he had those shoes on and the Lord whispered to him. And said, you'll never buy another pair of shoes the rest of your life. Said, so just like when I call you to preach, I don't have to recall you in five years. Once you're called, you're called. And the Lord told him that. He said, Brother Winslow, I've never, ever had to buy a pair of shoes. At this time, Brother Barnes was about 83 years old. He said, I've never ever had to buy a pair of shoes and the Lord told me that every time that I move on someone to buy you a pair of shoes he said I will put a special anointing of faith on them and that the things that I've spoke to you will become a part of their life and their ministry and he said brother Winslow you just saved yourself years and years of, of seeking God about things in the word of God because what God's revealed to me he's going to reveal to you now, that's the power of a mentor. Now, us pastors know this. I don't think saints know this. They should know it. And if you don't know it, you should start knowing it. That so many times a pastor will preach something and you'll sit there and say, well, that's not for me because I'm not going through that. But less than a month later, you're going through it. And you wasn't listening. You wasn't paying attention. But the man of God was releasing something. Uh, into the atmosphere that you were going to need not very long from that moment that, that you heard it. I remember when uh, I first called to preach and uh, uh, we had three children at that time, three girls. I went to my pastor. God had called me to preach. I went to my pastor and I said, I, 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 I feel the need to go to Bible school. And my pastor looked at me and said, no, you're, you're not going to Bible school. I said, well, why can't I go to Bible school? Give me one good reason. He said, I'm going to give you three. You got three kids. He said, but if you'll come to this church and apply yourself, he said, Bible school will come to you. And I mean to tell you right then, God spoke to me and told me what to do. I went home. I was still pouting. You know, I, I wanted to go to Bible school like some of the other preachers were going. And so I pouted a little bit and, and uh, for a few days, but finally I got over it and and the Lord began to speak to me and he said, the man of God was right. I'm going to bring Bible school to you. And you're going to be so far ahead in three years of all those young people going to Bible school. He said, there's three things I want you to do. And if you'll do these three things, 
You'll learn things about me that they don't teach in Bible school. He said, number one, I want you to be at church early. And I want you to pray. I want you to be the first one there if possible. And I want you to pray before church. I want you to be the last one to leave the building. I went, oh my God, I think I, I'd way rather go, rather go to Bible school. <laughs> be the first one there. Pray before church. Be the last one to leave. Go down to the altar and, and, and wait for the sinners. When the altar calls given, be the first one down there. And he said, and the third thing I want you to do is I want you to start writing down the words of revelation and wisdom that your pastor is going to start speaking. And he may not know it, but he's going to be speaking some of them to you. And so I became a recorder and I started writing things down. When the kids wasn't cutting up and I wasn't having to snap my fingers and threaten them to an inch of their life. Or that I wasn't so wore out and tired from working or things of that nature. Every service, God would speak seven words to me. Just like in every November, God speaks seven things to me. He's going to do in the coming year. I remember one year God spoke to me in November. It was November, uh, month of November, uh, 2015. He said in 2016, there'll be 150 miracle conceptions of couples that can't have children. And, and would you believe it? I mean, if I was making a story up, I wouldn't tell you that it was 170 something. I'd just say, well, God did 150. But he didn't do just 150. How many knows that God can go beyond even what he tells you? There were over 170 miracle conceptions. I've got several of them on my phone. One of them was in Topeka, Kansas. And there was, it was the last thing I did on the very last five minutes of that revival. Uh, we, we had altar call and uh, I was about to turn the service back to the pastor. And there was a lady there, young, a young lady there. And I said, come up here. I want to pray for you. And I said, uh, where's your husband? And she said, wait, he's in the sound booth. I said, tell him to come up here. And so it, 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 she, he came up there and I said, uh, you've been trying to have a baby. And I said, I'm going to lay my hand on you and you're going to have a, have a baby. And then the Lord, to build her faith up, he said, why does God operate in word of knowledge and word of wisdom and, and miracles and faith and those nine gifts of the Spirit? Because they are faith builders. When God starts telling me things, I'm just like you. My faith goes out the roof. And I just get excited. When God gives me a dream, when God gives me a vision, when God tells me something, I mean, uh, there was one lady I was praying for in California and the Lord said, she is so depressed down and out depressed. She's tried to commit suicide three times. And he said, I'm going to encourage her. I'm going to go overboard to encourage her. And he said, I'm going to tell you her name and the name of her kids and her address. And when you get through doing that, she's going to believe anything you tell her. And so I told this lady, step out. She stepped out. And I could see what God told me was true. She was very depressed. Uh, and, and her faith was so low. And I said, if I told you that God's going to show me the name of your kids and you and where you live at, would you believe that? Well, she didn't say yes. She just looked at me. And uh, I didn't know her name up to that point. Now, that's faith, isn't it? Yeah. To be in front of everybody. On Facebook and everywhere and tell somebody God's going to show you the name and you don't even know who they are. And so if you want my job, just let me know and you can start doing this tonight. We'll just when I get through preaching, I'll give you the microphone and you can do this. And uh, and, uh, and so I said, your name is Linda. And I mean, God showed it to me plain as day, just written right in front of me. I saw it and I said, your name's Linda. And I said, you have a son whose name is Stephen. You call him Steve. And you have two daughters. One is named Diane. I can't remember the name of the other uh, daughter. And I said, and uh, uh, Steve or Stephen is incarcerated in prison. And you just got a letter from him in which his life has been in danger. And they have him in lockdown somewhere. 
And, uh, and, and, and the Lord told me to tell you, I said, what is March 16th? And she said, that's his birthday. I said, by his birthday, you're going to see a miracle. By his birthday, March the 16th, he's going to have the Holy Ghost. He's going to be saved. And God's going to uh, release him early. And he's getting out. And, uh, boy, I mean, her faith had just soared. The gifts of the Spirit will lift us up. Yes. Amen. I mean, why, if you have a baseball bat, would you fight an intruder? And just lay your bat down and say, well, I don't want to, you know, I'm just going to fight with my hands. I mean, why would you do that? Why would you dig a hole that has to go down three foot and four foot wide with a spoon when you have a shovel? Huh? Why would you do those things? So why would the church try to fight battles and try to have church without the gifts of the spirit? I don't care who believes and doesn't believe in them. That's not my job to make people believe in them. But I believe in them and I know they're part of the church because wherever the Holy Ghost is, these nine gifts, 1 Corinthians 12, are there and they're going to operate if there is obedience and yielding and faith in the midst of that church. Do you know that when you get around faith, it creates faith? Do you know that when you get around the gifts of the Spirit, it creates the gifts of the Spirit. When you get around miracles, it creates more miracles. And that's what mentorship does. The Holy Spirit mentors you. The Word of God will mentor you. The pastor will mentor you. The evangelist, you know, he'll try. Uh, saints of God in this church that are elders. I go to churches and the elders think because they're old, oh, well, you know, we, we're just, you know, our day is over. No, your day's not over. You can mentor. You can tell the stories of what God did for you. And when you get old enough, you don't care. You know what they think about you. You can even tell them mistakes that you made. Trouble you had in your marriage. And things of, of that nature. Well, the Holy Ghost is fixing to mentor everybody in this church. I'm going to lay hands on several. See, I'm not getting, God's telling me some things. And remember, remember in leadership, I told you last night, but I'm not going to get ahead of myself. I almost told somebody I was going to pray for them, but I remember what I said last night, praise God. And so I'm not saying anything till we get to the right place. There's somebody sitting in this church that has a tightness and a choking in your throat and you have a cough and it comes and goes, but it's never completely gone. It's not a cold, but it's something else. And God's going to heal you in this service tonight. You believe God can do that? Amen. If I told you everybody's leaving tonight, no depression, no discouragement. God gave me a dream last night. In that dream, I was praying for people that were discouraged and battling oppression and depression. And God was healing that and sending, a, I mean, literally my dreams. I saw demons going to the pits of hell and being bound there by the Lord. Yeah. Isn't it awesome that God can do those kind of things? Yeah. Now, my mother uh, 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 suffered a depression, mental depression for years. And I suffered the same thing. I inherited it from my mother. And, uh, and when God gave me the Holy Ghost, about three months after getting the Holy Ghost, God delivered me. And set me free of those things. And when my mother got saved, I prayed for her and God delivered her of that depression. Nobody's going home tonight depressed. Everybody's going home encouraged. Do you believe it's possible that God could touch you in such a way that you never be discouraged, never be despondent, never be oppressed again? I believe it's possible. Now, you could get concerned about bills and get concerned about things. But I'm talking about where it just starts breaking you down. So God moves by mentorship. I told this lady, I said, by March 16th, I said, this guy's going to have the Holy Ghost. And he did. And, uh, and I, I said, you, uh, I see two numbers. I see a zero and a six. I said, do you know what that is? I didn't know what it was. And she said, I don't know what 06 is. I said, well, think about it. I mean, I'm sure you do. She said, no, I don't. I said, well, Lord, she doesn't know. What is 06? And then I saw her uh, in my mind, not a vision, but I saw her in my mind going into her door and her address was 306. And I said, oh, my God. I said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Don't you know your own address? 
I said, the last two letters uh, of your address is 06. And after church, he said, well, why didn't God show you the three? I said, because it's nobody's business on Facebook or anywhere else where you live. I said, God's smarter than that. I said, you need to be smart enough to know where you live at. And God can do great things for you. And so Brother Barnes became a mentor to me. And he started and he would he was teaching me and showing me things and telling me things. And it was shorting the duration of my learning. You learn by uh, examples or, or, or uh, uh, troubles in your life, going through things. Or you can learn through a mentor. Someone that can tell you something. When somebody shares a story with you when they're preaching, grab hold of that. Because you're, you're going to go through the same thing. Everybody is either going through a trial or coming out of one or will soon go into one. I mean, everybody. You start feeling sorry for yourself. Don't feel sorry for yourself because everybody else goes through them. But just because you're in the lion's den doesn't mean you can't sleep. And you can't rest. And you can't flourish. Even Joseph in the prison flourished. Even when he was a slave in the house of Potiphar, he flourished. Even when he was lied on. Oh, come on, somebody. Are you understanding what I'm talking about right now? I mean, I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. Please feel a little bit of the Holy Ghost tonight. I mean, I'm not asking you to feel as much as I feel, but feel a little bit tonight. So that we can really get something done. And God can do some great things for everybody in this building. I mean, I spent the, not all the day, but some of most of the day today getting myself ready for this service tonight so that God could do something great in this place. And so uh, God uses mentors. You want to let God mentor you. And so through the years, there's been people that have spoke to me, laid hands on me and, and taught me things. And, and I, uh, I believe in that with all my heart. And so I didn't go to Bible school, but I would write down these things in every service. I might not get seven things every night because kids and weary a little bit, getting off the job and different things. But almost every night, God would highlight seven things in that service. I would write them down. I don't have all the notes, but I still have some of them. I can open some of my old Bibles and, and on, the, on the index are the, those things that God spoke to me and the date and who was preaching and, and uh, God began to speak to me. Going to church early to pray and going to the altar and working with sinners when they go to the altar. Reading the word of God, fasting and praying. Well, I remember uh, when I started graduating from God's uh, Bible school. I remember all things, things started happening. I was sitting there uh, on the front pew and uh, the Lord spoke to me and, this, and he said, they're going to sing this page. And I, I said to myself, is that really God? I mean, why would God tell me about what song they're going to sing? Well, that's called school. You know what I'm saying? When you go to school to be a plumber, you don't go plumbing. You know, you got little uh, things and threads and caps and pipes that go nowhere. And you're learning how to do it. When you become a welder, you don't just get a welding rod and a machine and go out there to somebody's house and learn out there. You're welding inside a shop that goes nowhere. Metal that's not connected to trailers or anything. And so God was training me. And, uh, and so I'm sitting there and I remember the first time God said, they're going to sing this page. And I said, what? And I got the song book and I turned to that page and I looked up to see. And, and sure enough, that song leader would say that page and not every service, but many services. God would say, stand up, lift your hands because my presence is about to fall on the church. And I would stand up and lift my hands and three or four or five minutes, everybody be standing. They weren't standing because I was standing. They were standing because of the moving of the Spirit of God. Don't you want to be connected? Don't you want to have access to the power of God? Don't you want the enemy to know that if he gets with you and messes with you, he's got to go through Jesus to get to you? Don't you want to be covered by the blood? Things of that nature. 
And so I would be turning the pages and, and uh, I'd stand when just before the, I, the spirit of weeping would come on me before the spirit of weeping on the church. So one night God spoke to me the page they were going to sing from. So I turned there in the hymnal and all of a sudden my pastor comes off the platform, runs down beside me and stands beside me and looks at my songbook. And I thought, what in the world? I mean, it scared me. And he said, I just want to see if you're really turning to the page. Well, I'd not told him anything. He just, you know, pastors are very observant. And he was watching me turn these pages. And so I'm standing there all assured that they're going to, I mean, not once did the, the people not call out the name of that song. So I'm standing there just all assured. Here's the man of God. And the song leader says the number of a page, but it's not the one I'm turned to. I said, oh, my God, of all the times to miss it. It's the time when the man of God is standing there looking right down his nose through his glasses at me. And I said, oh, Lord. And God whispered to me and said, just hold on. I gave you a word. And the, my pastor looked at me as if to say, I'm going to talk to you after church. And about that time, the song leader said, I'm sorry. That was another day. I looked at the wrong piece of paper. This is the page number. And it was the right one. Yeah. And you know what I did? I just opened it up a little wider. <laughs> and I just shoved it toward the man of God to let him see what the Lord had done. Well, he called me in his office and he said, I want to know what's going on. And I said, well, sometimes God tells me things. You mean God's telling you the page number of a song? Well, what's so important about that? And, and of course, I didn't know the answer. I said, I thought, I told the pastor, I thought the same thing. I didn't think he's training me. He's getting me used to hearing his voice. He's getting me used to trusting him and believing in him. Huh? You know, the secret of what happens in this church is what happens during the day in your life. Even though services can really go, but sometimes they can't go any higher than what you did before you walked in this building. And so the secret, God told me this, one of the laws of the supernatural is the secrets of miracles are in your everyday walk with God. The little things you think is not important will be important keys to open big doors when you're in service and you're in church. And so the man of God called me in the office and he said, whatever you're doing, just keep doing it. And so I was going to Bible school. I'm telling you, there is a prophetic word about these days that we're living in. God has spoke many things about these last days. That apostle, Brother Barnes, spoke so many things to me. And one of the things he told me was seven things that was going to happen toward the end time. And I've seen four of those things already transpire since he passed away several years ago. But after Brother Barnes passed away, I was in California preaching revival. And Brother Barnes got sick. He'd never been to the hospital all the days of his life. But he got very sick and they took him to the hospital. And he was just a week or so away from passing, 93 years old. And, uh, and so my wife called me on the phone, Brother Barnes is sick, pray for him. And, uh, and so sure enough, he passed away within a few days of that. And so I'm in California preaching several revivals. And my wife said, well, you better get a ticket. And I said, well, it's going to be very expensive last minute, but I'm going to get a ticket. And I started thinking, I said to myself, you know, what can I do by going to that funeral except show honor? I said, I could almost hear Brother Barnes tell, tell me, let the dead bury the dead. I mean, Brother Barnes is that kind of guy. And so I told my wife, no, I'm not coming. And I said, I'm just going to take, during the funeral, I'm just going to take time to honor the man of God. And I'm not going to do anything during that time. And so uh, all of a sudden, the Lord spoke to me that night during church, and he said, get back to that funeral. And so I bought a ticket, and I flew back, and it was very expensive. And so the place was packed out. I got there an hour and a half early, and the place was completely packed out as church. And so the two people get up just before the service begins, sitting beside me. They get up and they walk out. 
And there's people in the uh, cafeteria, in the fellowship hall, and, and they're uh, uh, videoing, uh, sending the picture of the service over there on a big screen. And, and, uh, and the place just packed in. And I leaned to my wife and said, well, boy, if they're coming back, somebody's going to get their seat. And about that time, Sister no- Nona Freeman sat down yeah. with Sandra, her daughter. And I turned and saw Sister Freeman. I said, Sister Freeman. Now, Sister Freeman was good friends with Sister Winslow. And Sister Freeman would preach for us in our church, the churches we pastored through the years. Her and Brother Freeman. And then when Brother Freeman passed away, she would come. And uh, I don't know that Sister Freeman liked me, but I do know that she loved Sister Winslow. So I'd always have Sister Winslow ask her to come. Because she would tell me no, but she wouldn't tell Sister Winslow no. And so several times, Sister Freeman would go to Africa because, remember, she was a missionary there for 40 years or whatever it was, 50. And, uh, and so Sister Winslow went with her to Africa several times. And the last time that Sister Freeman went to Africa, just months, a few months before she passed, Sister Winslow went with her. So S- Sister Freeman comes in. Now, remember what I'm telling you? Mentors. Mentors can shorten the duration of your troubles and your trials. Mentors can lay hands on you and impart wisdom and understanding in your life. The man of God, every time he speaks, he's imparting wisdom that can really help you. And you should take notes and you should remember what's being spoken because you will use those things in your life. And if nothing else, you'll impress God that you really are, you really are excited about what he's telling you. I mean, it, it, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not God, but I can't stand it when somebody's looking at their watch or the clock or picking their nose or, you know, whatever they're doing. I mean, it doesn't excite me as a preacher. There's some people I have to look away from them. Because they're yawning and they're sleeping and they're texting and they're just, and, and I mean, it's so disrespectful. And could you imagine what God thinks when you're sitting in there and he's given the word of God to the man of God and you got your mind on mowing the yard or shopping down at the secondhand store. Now, look, we're all human and we have thoughts of those things, but it doesn't mean you got to let them stay there. Huh? Put that lawnmower up. Put that purse up. Get out of that shop. Get out of that mall. And get your eyes and your mind and your spirit. Because when you do that, God's going to tell you something. That's going to save you a time in trouble. And so uh, Sister Freeman sitting beside me. I said, Sister Freeman, Sister Sandra. And all of a sudden, I don't know if you know Sister Freeman. She's a straight to the point person. So she don't say, hi, Brother Winslow. She don't lean over and say, hi, Sister Winslow. She says, you better be glad You came to this funeral. And I said, she said, you almost didn't come. Well, I know that Sister Freeman operated in the gifts of the Spirit. I know that God spoke to her things. I know that she spoke into my life almost every time that she preached for us. And so I knew that she knew. She wasn't guessing. She said, you had to hear God tell you to come. Or you wasn't going to come. And you said this. Well, Brother Barnes wouldn't want me to come. She said, this is not about Brother Barnes. This is about God. And God doesn't care what Brother Barnes thinks about it. And I was going, wow, man, she's tearing into me and Brother Barnes. And he's not even here to take a whooping. Of course, her and Brother Barnes were good friends. And uh, uh, Sister Freeman wrote the last book about the life of Brother Barnes. She was the, uh, the co-author, or whatever you call it, writing that book about him, uh, Tom the Prophet. And so uh, uh, she just looks at me. She says, today is the day that the mantle of Brother Barnes is given to you. And I was going, what? I thought for sure Brother Stone King would get it. I even think he thinks he did, but what, whatever. <laughs> he didn't have a sister Freeman telling him anything. I can tell you that right now. And so uh, she tells me this. And I mean, I didn't feel nothing. I thought an angel would touch me. I thought I'd fall out in the aisle and be talking in tongues or, you know, or after I left the funeral, you know, driving in my car back home, 
catching the plane, whatever, to get back to revival. I thought, but nothing happened. So I'm back in California. I'm preaching for Brother, uh, Brother Nelson in San Jose, California. And while I'm preaching, in the middle of that preaching, the power of God came down. And people started worshiping God and magnifying God. Uh, Holy Ghost interruption took place. I wish everybody felt the Holy Ghost like I do. I mean, I'm way up here in the Holy Ghost. I'm going to have to come down where you're at because I'm fixed to blow you away here in a minute. And I, I, too much power. Uh, I'd rather you come up to where I'm at. But I'm just going to give you a few more minutes and I'm going to have to come down where you're at. And, uh, and so all of a sudden I'm preaching. The power of God came down in that service and I couldn't preach anymore. And, the, and people started praising and magnifying God. And I just felt an overwhelming anointing of the Spirit. I wasn't thinking mantles. And so Brother Nelson, the pastor, walks up to me and he whispers in my ear and he says, everybody's worshiping. He said, Brother Winslow, I never see anything. God doesn't use me in the gifts of the Spirit like he does you. He said, but a while ago, as we were all praising, I saw a mantle come down and said, it's just physical, came down and rested on your shoulders. And after a few minutes, now, you know, it's God, because I've never heard this from anyone. Not like this. He said, all of a sudden, it was just loosely fitting on you. And then it went and it just completely fit the mold of your body. I said, poor mantle. Take on my physical physique. And, uh, and he said, and there was a name on it. I said, Brother Nelson, you don't even have to say one word because I know what was written on that mantle. He said, you know, I said, yes, I do. I said, Sister Nona Freeman had told me. I said, that mantle had the name of uh, T.W. Barnes on it, didn't it? And he said, yes, it did. And immediately, and immediately, now what does a mentor do? He deposits it. He gives you, he, he gives you understanding. He, you can, I've got goosebumps right now. He, he gives you uh, new power levels. Could you imagine if you could live to be 140 years old? How smart you'd be. What if you could retain the knowledge you have right now and go back and be 15? You're excited about that, huh? I get it. I get it, sister. I do. Me and you. I'm getting loud, too. Me and you both get it. Could you imagine? I, I tell you what I would do if I went back at 15 at my age. First of all, I'd be the teacher's pet. Second of all, I'd read my school books all the time. I'd study for tests. I wouldn't care what the kids in the class called me. Huh? I would learn things. I'd never have a fist fight because you don't win anything. You're not getting a purse. Nobody's paying you for fighting. Instead of getting a knot on your head for free. I mean, you know, at least, you know, make money doing it or don't do it at all. I'd be a nerd. I'd study. I'd get saved quicker. I'd give everything I've got to God. I would put God very first in my life. Well, why wait for something that may never happen, not going to happen, and just say to yourself, whatever years I've got left, I'm going to start putting God first. I'm going to start giving God my best. I'm going to start making good use of my life. Well, I'm not going to tell you how young I was when I got married. I'll just tell you this, back in those days, people got married really young. And I would never tell my grandkids how young Sister Winslow and I were because I don't want them to get married that early. But we got married very young in those days and went through a lot of things. And we try to tell our kids and our grandkids. I've got one of my grandkids. He's just a really loving kid and he's 15 and he cares about people. I've seen him reach in his pocket, have $23 in there, and leave it for a tip. And I tell him, Bryce, you, you don't have to leave that much money. He said, that guy works hard, Papa. I watched him and said, why shouldn't I just give him everything I got? And I said, well, I know there's some reason why you shouldn't. But... I'm afraid to tell you because I don't know, maybe God's doing something in your life and maybe I need to keep my mouth shut. 
And, uh, but he, he's a different kid. And he's been bullied at school because of it. Because they take his love and his kindness as weakness. And I, I've told him, just call me on the phone. And I said, when they start giving you a hard time, I'll come up there. He said, Papa, I don't want you coming up here. I said, why? He said, you'll get in trouble. I said, yeah, and I'll get out. And I said, Grandma will bail me out. I said, I don't want you being picked on. I don't want you being bullied. He said, don't worry, Papa. God's taking care of me. I went, oh, my God, really? This kid's teaching me things. And so having the mentorship spirit of God operating in your life. So this mantle comes on and, and I get a confirmation from Brother Nelson. And, and, uh, and immediately I started sensing and feeling things in the spirit. Now, Brother Barnes had a ministry that bound demons. And if you ever listen to anything on YouTube with T.W. Barnes, and you'll immediately pick up the faith that he had. And how, but, God, but many times witches would come to his church. And he would deliver those people from that spirit of witchcraft. And demons and devils would attack people. And he would minister and send those spirits back to hell. And it wasn't the only thing he did, but he had that kind of ministry. I didn't. Until that mantle got on me. And then one day, not long after that day, the mantle came down. A witch comes in and sits down in the service. I wouldn't have known it, but God said there's a witch here. And he said, there she is. And I looked back there and the God showed me who she was. And she was, she was chanting something beneath her breath. I couldn't hear it. But she was chanting something over and she was rocking back and forth. And her eyes would roll back in her head. And, and I said, what's going on, God? I said, she's come here to put a curse on you. And I said, well, there's no way you could put a curse on a child of God. If a child of God has the blood of Jesus on them, they're just going to waste their time. And I said, why would she want to come and try to do that to someone that's got the blood? He said, because I'm letting her come because she's going to get a spanking. I said, well, God, you're going to spank her good. He said, no, me and you are going to spank her. I said, well, what's going to happen? He said, just listen to me and do what I tell you to do. And so here she comes down uh, 15, 20 minutes later, and she's got something in her hand, and she's walking, and she's chanting, and she's got this stuff inside her hands. I don't know, kind of look like ground up bat feet and <laughs> toad poop. I, mean, I don't know what all it was, but it was kind of a brownish gray looking stuff, and there was little things inside it. And she comes down chanting and she's walking toward me and I'm praying for somebody. I'm not making this up. And I said, well, God, what do I do? Because she's coming. He said, you just keep having faith. And don't you be afraid, he said, because I've got this. And so I, she's getting closer and closer and closer. And I want to tell God, well, you better hurry up. Because she's almost on me. And so she takes that hand that's cut with that stuff and she starts to go she's fixed to blow it on me and all of a sudden some wind came through me and passed me and blew that right in her face and she starts choking it's in her nose it's in her mouth it's on her face and she gags her way out nobody had to touch her don't you get it that the only enemy that can defeat you is you. That if you'll believe what that word says and speak that word and walk in the dimension of that word, there's nothing the enemy can do to defeat you or bring you down. You've got more power in you than the whole city around you. There is more that be for you than be against you. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. You need to ask God to let you see that revelation tonight. And start walking in that. Well, that wasn't the only time. There was another service I was in and and uh, it's, this man shows up, a real tall guy, and he's very thin, and uh, he has no eyebrows and no hair. And I mean, probably didn't have any hair anywhere else, but I mean, it was, there was no hair anywhere. 
I don't know what that meant. God wouldn't even tell me. And so he's sitting back there. And I mean, the Lord didn't even have to tell me. I said, that guy right there is of the devil. And he kept staring at me. He didn't have anything in his hands, but he kept staring at me. And some of the people after church said they could hear a growl way down inside his throat during the service. And said, Brother Winslow, he wanted you bad. And so he gets up and starts walking down the center aisle. And he comes and stands right there. And I'm up on the platform preaching. And he stands right there. And all of a sudden, he started staring at me. And I mean, shaking all over and looking at me. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't feel nothing. And I said, God, what is he doing? I mean, because it was distracting. And, uh, and I said, God, what's he doing? He said, well, he's trying to put a whammy on you. He's trying to curse you. And once again, I said, he can't curse me. I've got the blood of Jesus on me. Right, church? Same as you. And the Lord said, I said, what do I do? Lord, he's distracting. He said, give him the Holy Ghost eyes. I said, Lord, I, what is that? You're not going to believe what God told me. He said, just make it up. I'm with you. <laughs> Can you believe that? I, I, I mean, it blew my mind. He said, just make it up. Because whatever you make up, I'm going to be with you on it. Remember what he told Adam? What is that? That's a cow. Then a cow it's going to be. What's that? That's a lion. Then a lion is what it's going to be. Well, God can give us the kind of authority that just whatever we say and speak, that's right, you know, and not, not wrong. God can work in it. And so I just made it up. I thought, you know, as a kid, I played hardball baseball. I was a pitcher. So what I did was in my mind, I wound up like a wind up pitch. He's there. I go back like this and I go, and I go in Jesus name. And man, I mean, he it snapped him like that. He took off running. He ran so fast. They left his car in the parking lot. Yeah. The usher came up after church and said, hey, that old warlock, he left his car out there. And the preacher said, well, if he's not in hell, he'll come back later and get it. Let's don't worry about it. I'm telling you folks right now, there's something about this service tonight that God wants to advance your faith and advance your spirit and, and get you in a place that you can understand things that you couldn't understand before. God wants to give you a transformation right now. Don't just come in this church and listen and, and say an amen every now and then. Get in this service and say to yourself, God's got something for me. And I'm going to receive it tonight. Right? Well, in the book of Job, chapter number 1 and verse number 10 is a verse. Now, 10 is the number of dominion. And God's going to give you dominion over a specific thing tonight. At the end of this service, when we get to the end of this service, I've got a word for you. I'm going to pray for you. God's fixed to touch you. You're fixed to experience some big breakthroughs in your life. There's some things that's been uh, intimidating you all your life that you'll never be intimidated anymore. God said, I'm, it's all right to have the spirit of the lamb, but there's sometime you've got to have the spirit of the lion. And you're going to start getting the spirit of the lion. And God's going to put an anointing, a promotion on you that's going to promote you in the spirit realm. It's going to promote you in your family. And it's going to promote you in the kingdom of God. And it's going to promote you on your job. Get ready. God said, I'm going to make you the head and not the tail. Amen. God's going to give you Deuteronomy 28, 13. Amen. Matter of fact, before you leave tonight, I want to write that on your right shoe. So that you can walk out of here stepping and standing on Deuteronomy 28, 13. I shall make you the head and not the tail. You shall be from above and not beneath. How many believe God can do that? Matter of fact, I believe he's going to do it right now. Come on, brother. Come over and lay hands on him right now in the name of Jesus. Both of you. Just come pray for him right now. Everybody else, stretch your hand this way and let's pray for this brother. Father, in the name of Jesus, let no weapon formed against him prosper right now. God, you said you're going to put him at the head of the line. You said you're going to give him Revelation chapter 5. The line... In the lamb, tenderness 
and power and strength. Not many days after this day, saith the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God will come upon you. And God will anoint you and you're going to have a great breakthrough and you'll never be the same person ever after that. In Jesus name. Woo! Hallelujah. Come on, let's praise him. If you'll praise God, God can do it for you.